Quite possibly as powerful a belief that pervades the globe as human nature beliefs is the belief in free will, which is simply defined as the ability uh, to make decisions free from constraints, suggesting that there is somehow an independence of the brain that is unrelated to everything around us that affects it. Now, I'm aware that this is an extremely contentious subject, as the existence or absence of free will calls into question a myriad of other beliefs and traditions that many people cling to, spanning across uh, religious, political, and legal institutions, and the entire monetary system itself. So let's delve into it. What do we know? Well, we don't usually attribute other natural phenomena, like storms, tectonic plate movement, growth of trees, or the ocean's tidal movements, to free will, no matter their unpredictability since we understand that they are the result of a chain of causes and effects strictly obeying the laws of physics. So if our desires and choices are likewise the result of natural law, then the notion of free will is to be discredited. If our minds are merely brains containing electrochemical signals, as they certainly appear to be to neuroscientists, then we have no free will. Why do we assume that, why do we assume that our brains are exempt from these natural laws? It is likely because we are uncomfortable about not really being in control of our decisions that were really just biochemical social machines. There's a fascinating uh, BBC documentary called The Secret You. The ending scene shows a fascinating experiment designed to demonstrate exactly this, that what seem like decisions or free choices uh, to us are really governed by neuronal processes that we're not consciously aware of. Uh, Professor Marcus de Sautoy, who conducts the sequence of events in the episode, is on a quest to find the true source of our decisions is told to randomly decide to press either uh, a left or a right button. At the same time, his brain is hooked up to a scanner system to record the brain activity that led up uh, to the decision of either, uh, to, uh, that led up to making the decision of e uh, to press either button, and the computer records when the button was pressed. The results were quite astonishing to the professor. They could uh, determine up to six seconds in advance of the decision, of the decision he was going to make each time, uh, simply by scanning the pattern of neuronal activity in his brain. So this implies that our conscious decisions are secondary things to our actual brain activity. Truly fascinating, and this experiment has been performed dozens and dozens of times, and the results are always the same. To reiterate, the experiment reveals that there's a deterministic mechanism that leads up to your decision at a later point that's inevitable. It can only go that way. Much of the time, we make the mistake about attributing certain behavior to free will simply because we're ignorant about the source of behavior. The more we understand about the sources of behavior, including plant and animal tropisms, the less we tend to attribute behavior to free will or instinct, which is another, you know, as I mentioned, nothing word that really gives no information about the source of the behavior. Uh, Jacques Loeb's work, as I mentioned, is wonderful to look at for this issue, specifically his book, The Mechanistic Conception of Life, which still holds much value even after all these years. All of Loeb's work with the word instinct was eventually thrown out, and he said there are certain patterns of behavior we haven't yet been able to decipher. Let's hunt them out. Let's try to find the mechanism that's ge that generates the behavior. Free will is akin to the God of the gaps type arguments. You can't just squeeze free will into the gaps, into whatever gaps we have in our, in our understanding because, we, uh, because you want it there. In short, your brain's decision-making circuitry in your frontal lobes controls your choices. When you choose between a papaya or a banana, patterns of neuronal activity representing these two possibilities appear in your prefrontal cortex. Copies of each pattern grow and spread at different rates depending on your past experiences and sensory impressions. Eventually, the number of copies of one pattern passes a threshold and you pick either the papaya or the banana, or the buy the Honda or Toyota, or travel to Paris or Barcelona. I've been going through another book called The Myth of Free Will, comp compiled by Chris Evat, which is a, a compilation book of about 50 academics across many fields of science, giving their take on the issue. A great point made throughout the book uh, is that people seem to intellectually reject the idea of free will, yet they live their lives as if it exists, meaning that while we logically understand it's an unscientific idea, we haven't yet been able to incorporate this value uh, into our value system. Which brings me back once again to the idea of sustainable values. If we were to really understand and embrace the reality of the myth of free will, there would be immense implications for society, not only in how we perceive ourselves and our fellow human beings, but in the very structure of society itself, which again would suggest that the absolute need for radical reform to a resource-based economy. So the implications would be as follows. 
we can no longer blame people or get justifiably angry at people since they are just a product of all the environmental forces they've been exposed to combined with their biology. We must entirely reform how we treat aberrant behavior. Aside from the powerful case for the need of reform of the prison system by uh, people like Dr. James Gilligan, the legal and prison systems operate with the, with the assumption that criminals are individually responsible for their actions and that it is the person that must be punished rather than the environment that created them that must be radically altered. And most importantly, this understanding invalidates premises, many premises amongst which, uh, or upon which the monetary market system is based such as that people who work harder deserve more fruits for their supposed contribution to society, ignoring, of course, the irrelevancy of most jobs. People's efforts can only be as good as their environments permit them to act, so why would we re reward something that they cannot help? Some people get more, and some people get less, not because of any worthy worthiness or deserving quality, but because people had unequal environments that granted some people with the ability to succeed in the market system and others without it. It's as simple as that.